Donald King for inviting me to um, this very important uh, International Congress. Uh, for me, it's an honor and a privilege uh, that I've been invited here to address distinguished colleagues, and artists, and intellectuals from around the world. Uh, it, really means, it really means a lot to me because it uh, shows that after all the years that I've been an artist and an activist, that finally um, I've been being taken seriously and that the, uh, the fruit of my labor has started to pay off. Um, I want to start off by saying that we're in very, very, very serious trouble. <laughs> I'm not going to talk too much about Trump the man. We all kind of more or less know who he's about, what he's done. So I'm not going to really get into the ins and outs of Donald Trump's and what his politics are. Or I'm not, or am I going to speculate about his political agenda. I will be doing that later this week on the Get the Box uh, podcast. I will do a more extended uh, political analysis of that. But here, I just want to talk about Trump globalization infringement and to talk about what this means for artists and culture in general. I'm not surprised by Trump's victory. A lot of people are. I'm not. Um, I've seen this coming for 20 years. Um, I wrote a book in the 1990s called The Fall of New York. Um, it was my first show here at the Infringement Festival back in 2005. We did it in Montreal, New York. I also did it in Ottawa in 06. And I warned very specifically that this was coming. Um, I was not surprised at all. Uh, this didn't happen overnight, people. This has been a process that's been going on uh, pretty much uh, since Ronald Reagan, uh, kind of go back to 1982, uh, really when globalization took off. Um, so Kim was no surprise to me. Didn't quite expect that he would win, but I wasn't surprised that he did win. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about globalization. Globalization is, in fact, capitalism. Okay? Since capitalism began, it has been globalization. We can even go back to the 1400s when Portugal colonized Africa. The whole of the beginning of uh, Columbus coming here, this was the beginning of globalization. The transatlantic slave trade was the beginning of globalization. Colonialization is globalization. This has been a process that's been in the works for more than 500 years. Now, it's kind of been happening more um, since the 1960s. I'm going to talk about that. And it's really kind of accelerated since the 1980s, particularly with Margaret Thatcher. Now, World War is actually the ultimate expression of globalization. Because why the World War happened? Because the various capitalist countries needed markets. Capitalism is always about expanding markets, expanding spheres, uh, spheres of influence, and of course they compete with each other. So when markets are clogged up as they are, they need to go to war. That's why it's called World War. World War is the expression, the most ultimate expression of globalization, and we're also in a very, very danger right now of another war war. And actually, I'm not, I don't call it World War III, I call it Global War, because this will actually be the ultimate war. And we're in very, very, very serious trouble. <coughs> Recent manifestations of globalization really began in the 1960s. One of the most important, uh, interesting exhibitions I ever went to was right here at the Museum of Fine Arts here in Montreal, and it was a really good exhibition back in the three called the 1960s. And it was, it was very, quite informative, and I was quite surprised by many things. Um, the idea of the launch, they showed the launching of the satellite, that was the beginning of the term global village. Right? Um, I'm gonna also say how a lot of artists and intellectuals kind of embraced global village, globalization, and they did so from a thinking of a, a very kind of a progressive perspective to get her out, out of pro, um, provincialism, parochialism, and things like that, and we kind of embraced that. But the most interesting thing was Pepsi. It was very interesting, and I had no idea that the thing, the name pop music was actually invented by Pepsi. Because, yes, because soda pop. 
and Pepsi sponsored the Beatles' first tour of America, and all of the kind of uh, counterculture of the 60s, the kind of, all of this music was actually sponsored by Pepsi. That's what a pop music, doesn't mean popular music, it means soda pop. And the, uh, the TV shows in the 60s that would have uh, American Bandstand and the Top 40 were sponsored by Pepsi. And this is where pop music comes from. So we've, we've been dealing with corporatization of our culture now for 50 years. And it was very, very interesting, um, interesting uh, revelation for me. I'm going to tell you a little, I'm going to give you some personal anecdotes. Um, I uh, closed Woodstock 94. It was the 25th anniversary of Woodstock 94. I'm going uh, to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, in addition to being a poet, writer, spoken word artist, I'm also a DJ and music producer. And I produced the first uh, jungle drum and bass rave in North America in 1994 in New York City. Now, I've always, since I've been an artist, I've always incorporated politics and social criticism into my art. Um, I'm going to get more into that in a second. But after our success with um, Jungle Warriors, we were invited to Woodstock 94. And there were two stages, so there was the rave stock that was to occur afterwards. We were the very last act, but we realized that Woodstock 94 was sponsored by Pepsi. <laughs> and we understood that this was actually a perversion of what the original Woodstock was. And so I was commissioned to come up with a flyer for our group, and it went like this. So uh, the riddle of the angels. Babylon equals Pepsi. Pepsi equals Woodstock. Woodstock equals $140. That's how much it was. $140 equals the choice of the next generation. Isn't recycling cool? So that was the flyer I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> and so we got there on the day before we were supposed to go. So we had uh, artists pass. We were able to go everywhere. So we were just handing these flyers out. Well, apparently, Pepsi didn't like that. <laughs> they didn't like that at all. So we got on, we played right after the Europe. I don't know if anyone remembers the Europe. They're not around anymore. We were a social techno group from the early 90s. We played right after the Europe. So we got on stage. It was international. We had a, a lead singer who was from France. Our DJ was from Brazil. We had a, a Tony Mola, a top uh, Brazilian master percussionist. And we had a choreographer from Zimbabwe and myself from New York. So uh, I was the MC with my uh, colleague. And the first thing we said, our generation wants to be free. Our generation wants everything to be for free. Our generation wants to share everything. And as soon as the DJ dropped the needle on the record, they pulled the plug. Yes, I closed with stop and maybe grow. It wasn't something that was very great. So I, I know this personally, as an artist, what we're dealing with, with Pepsi and corporatization of culture. So I've been dealing with this really well over 20 years. I'm going to talk about now totalitarian capitalism. This is very important because this is what we're dealing with. And I'm going to give a definition. I kind of came up with this term. I lived in Serbia for four years and I uh, met a very radical philosopher. His name is Lucy Simonovich. I'm not going to get too much into him, but he's a, a fierce critic of capitalism, particularly with sports. And he basically said that the capitalism is a totalitarian uh, order of death. And so I kind of, we worked together and I came up with the term totalitarian capitalism. What is that? It means that capitalism has reached the point where there is no space that's allowed not to be capitalist. Every sphere of life is under capitalism. Everything. I, I first saw this in uh, my poem, posters and bulletins. And it took me a while to really kind of, kind of, I always knew what I was talking about, but it took me a while to really fully synthesize what it is. Advertising, first and foremost, the purpose of advertising is not just to peddle wares or peddle goods or to promote certain uh, fashions and things like that. Advertising is basically the primary means to keep
keep the masses within the spiritual orbit of capitalism. That is what advertising is. We are bombarded by it all the time. Advertising is just the ultimate experience, the uh, ultimate expression of totalitarian capitalism, and it's um, one aspect of it. Also, totalitarian capitalism means there is no alternative. It goes back to Margaret Thatcher's famous phrase, Tina. Mm -hmm. There is no alternative. We have no alternative. We are in it. Whether we, even when we go to, even when we go to the bathroom, we, we deal with totalitarian capitalism. When we go on the internet, we're dealing with totalitarian capitalism. Every aspect of our life is under capitalism, and there's really no escape from it. And because there's no escape from it, we have to fight it. I'm going to get more into that later on. Now, I'm going to get into how, in the cultural sphere, how totalitarian capitalism works. I'm going to mention the French festival. Yeah. The French festival, particularly here in Montreal, it's, it's more than just the, that is the corporatization of art and culture. But it's the fact that a public street, a main public street, the main, is actually privatized. Right? Uh, Donovan King the other night did a really good address. I think he's going to do it again today, so he's going to elaborate again on that. But the fringe, what the fringe has become is the expression of totalitarian capitalism in the cultural sphere. And the fact is, is that the artists are uh, uh, brought into the spiritual orbit by actually having to pay to having to pay corporations for their own exploitation. Okay. What I call the French, people who organize the French, people, artists who support it, intellectuals who do it, I call them Coca-Cola intellectuals. It's kind of interesting to have Pepsi, um, but I call it, I got this from uh, Ducey Simonovich, to um, Coca-Cola intellectuals. Basically, these are people who not only uh, accept totalitarian capitalism, they justify totalitarian capitalism, they uh, make excuses for totalitarian capitalism, and that's what the, that's what the French has been doing. Oh, it's okay. We have to. We have to make money. We have to be corporate. We. Uh, the Coca-Cola intellectuals and the artists are the ones that actually are capitalistically degenerated. They use things like marketing, we have to leverage. They use all of these marketing terms in the cultural sphere. This is, this is absolute capitalist, uh, capitalist degeneration. I'm going to bring this back into Donald Trump. So the other day, he's going to, I guess he's going to reiterate this. This this summer, I was in Edmonton. Uh, where there was a guy who was disabled. He was a long time volunteer. And because he didn't have the ability to speak, he wasn't able to raise money. He was not capitalistically degenerated enough. So they excluded him. Well, what happened at the same time south of the border? Donald Trump ridiculed a disabled journalist, made fun of him, mocked him. And while Donald Trump is mocking a, a disabled journalist, the French Festival in Alberta is actually excluding disabled volunteers. Then there's a case where the uh, women came out saying that at the French, at the, at the, at the French Festival, uh, they were uh, sexually harassed and groped. It's been happening all the time. Same time, we hear all the reports about Donald Trump groping women and being a sexual, a sexual predator. Coincidence or conspiracy? Neither. These are the same forces that are in hand. This is what we're dealing with as far as that. I'm going to talk about the history of fascism because people, people, we need to grow up. We got to stop. No, really, we have to stop trying to say, oh, I had a conversation. Someone was saying, well, you know, you can't call Stephen Bannon uh, a Nazi because wow well, he he uh, he uh, he's not so he's not anti-Jewish. It's semantics. He's a white nationalist. It's like a, it's like splitting hairs between a Stalinist and a Maoist. Yeah, they're both they both have similar uh, basic philosophy. Stephen Bannon is a fascist. Now, most recently, he's appointed an arch segregationist as civil rights attorney. 
things are not, this is not going to be a retread of the Bushes or Reagan or even Nixon. The game's really different, and we need to wake up and understand that this is very, very serious. But there are historical parallels, and I'm going to mention the history of fascism briefly, because it does give us a kind of, this will help us navigate the future. First and foremost, and I was, now I have a steady fascism, I lived in Austria for five years, I lived in Germany for another year, and I lived in Eastern Europe, so I understand a little bit more about the nature of fascism just within from history books. Fascism, first and foremost, apart from it being an economic, political thing, it was actually an attack on art and culture. The whole basis of Hitler's anti-Jewish anti-Semitism was the fact was the culture, because most of the leading artists and intellectuals in Germany and Austria at the time were Jews. Right? What was it? It was degenerate art. Right? What did they like? What were they most attacked? They attacked uh, modernist art and they attacked jazz, which was known as Negro music. The first thing that the Nazis did was that they attacked the culture. They really went out of their way to go after the artists and to degrade the culture. You see the same thing in Austro-Fascism, which was <coughs> more um, a lighter variant of it, but that was the same thing. They, they closed all the museums, they closed all the galleries, and produced what was called folk, folk art. Yeah, this idea of safe art. Uh, safe art, art that glorifies the church, glorifies the farmers. And so the Nazis, their biggest cultural program was degenerate art. Right? They were saying art is degenerate. We have to attack the art artists. And it's very interesting because Kristallnacht did not really happen until 1938. But the main basis of uh, Nazi anti-Semitism was based on the cultural sphere. There are many, many forces that hated, hated the modernist cultural scene, and this was also in response to the Russian Revolution. To show you how dangerous this is, it took 40 years after Hitler before Germany was, start, was able to recover its culture. 40 years. In Austria, it was worse. It was actually 50 to 60 years. <coughs> Austria and Vienna has never recovered because all of the leading intellectuals, <coughs> all the leading artists were Jews. They were wiped out. It's now come back. I've been part of it in Vienna, but it's nothing. It was really what I learned was that it wasn't just a, um, a racial genocide. It was a cultural genocide. And that's what we're facing. We're facing the prospect of cultural genocide. Look at Spain. Spain had their dictatorship. Spain had a great, had a great literary, great artist tradition. Today, unfortunately, since 1982, even Spain has kind of Spain has not recovered from um, the pre-Franco years. Portugal as well. So. We have examples of how when a culture is destroyed, when artists are destroyed, it leaves, it leaves a society completely barren. And we're facing this danger. Don't be fooled because you're white. <laughs> Don't be fooled that you really think you're safe. And I'll tell you why. All of us here, each and every one of us, as far as Trump and his supporters are, we're cultural Marxists. That's what they call us. Okay? Before that, back in the back in the back in the twenties and thirties, we would have been called the Bolshevist Jews, right? But we're now called cultural Marxists. It's different, different, uh, different, uh, different name, but the same thing. Whether you're a Marxist or not, it doesn't matter. We're all in this room are considered cultural Marxists. And the knives are out for us. Okay. So don't be complacent with your white privilege. Because if you are an artist and an intellectual, the knives are out for you, as well as me. If you are a rapper, if you like hip hop, if you like any sort of, you like any sort of, you like any Latino music, you like salsa, you like anything, you are considered a race traitor. 
And actually, race traitors are more despised than people of color. So be very careful, people. Be very, very careful. Now, we have to remember that we are all the children of the Enlightenment and of humanism. So whether you're an artist or a writer, you're an actor, we all fall into the uh, category of humanities. And this was the biggest, big, one of the biggest contributions of the Enlightenment. Fascism, Donald Trump, is just the latest manifestation of forces that have always been against the Enlightenment. There are people who, there are forces that hated the, the Vatican, the, uh, the old aristocracy, People have never, ever forgiven us and, our, and uh, our predecessors for opening up. We really take advantage. We all think, oh, yes, we're intellectuals, we're free thinkers, we're artists. We, we're, an artist means being free. Well, actually, this is only new in human history, people. In the Middle Ages, there were no free artists. If you were an artist, you were basically paid, you were had to do what the Catholic Church told you, or what the local lord or the king did. There was no free art. You just couldn't just express yourself. This has only been around for 200, 300 years. It's really, really, that's a, that's a minute in history. We can't be complacent and think, well, yes, for the past 200, 300 years, we've had this. No, there have been forces that have repeatedly tried to attack this. And I'll give you an example. I don't want to just use fascism. I'm going to use the Biedermeyer period. Now, so we were probably art historians will know what the Biedermeyer period is. It was basically the period after the Napoleonic Wars up to 1848. Okay? But that was actually the first kind of modern totalitarian system because during the Biedermeyer period, all of the artists, particularly the classical music composers, were persecuted. Schubert, Franz Schubert, was actually underground. He had to at night. He had to secretly hide his notes. When he was playing on the piano, he had to play it very low. The the, the secret police would go around looking for artists. They would go into your. They would go into artists' composers' houses, and they actually had trained, trained musicians. And he would look. They could tell. They could look at the music because of Mozart. They always blame Mozart for the French Revolution. And so Schubert had to spend. He was an underground music composer. You know, a lot of people think, well, classical music, come on, it's the, it's the tamest music, it's the most, main, it's the most mainstream, it's the, no, it's not, actually. I learned this in Austria. Schubert was an underground artist. So the Biedermeyer period was a period of repression against artists. This is gonna come back, it's gonna come back, people are not gonna give up, we're in danger, people. I wanna talk about, uh, give some examples about Solutions. Um, I make no. I make no secret of my politics. Yes, um, I am a socialist. I don't push my politics on people, but that's what I am. And one of the reasons why I am a socialist is because of the contribution that socialism has given to 20th century art. Okay. Now we have to remember that until the 20th century, uh, art was actually the exclusive preserve of the aristocracy and the bourgeoisie. The workers weren't, we weren't, the workers weren't, they said, oh, they had no culture. And what the Marxists understood in Russia and Austria and in Germany was that you cannot <coughs> have a political program without a cultural program. It was hand in hand. They understood that. That's why in Red Vienna, when the, when the Austro-Marxists took over, not only did they build these great uh, palaces for the working class, but each one of these, what they call the mind of them, kind of social housing, each one had a, a theater. They, they knew that you had to have working class culture. That's why you had so many, so many writers and musicians and actors that came in. And again, this was a response what the fascists didn't like. Because, whoa, suddenly, well, the great unwashed masses are now have culture? No, 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 no. This is that. So the Marxists did a, uh, that was the biggest cultural development of, of the biggest contribution to 20th century culture was Marxism. The Harlem Renaissance. 
perhaps still, I would argue, we could have a debate about it and there, but the Harlem Renaissance was probably the greatest art and cultural movement in American history and perhaps in the world. And a lot of people don't realize this, but the Harlem Renaissance was only possible, was only made possible because of the Russian Revolution. And they were very open about it. Every single, every, not everyone, but most of them were all inspired by the Russian Revolution. Jazz music, which was also came out of the Harlem Renaissance, was also an expression, a direct cultural expression of the Russian Revolution. That is why, that is why the fascists were so opposed to uh, jazz. Um, so yeah, uh, that's why uh, in the 1930s, yeah, well, uh, people forget that in the U.S. that the Communist Party, the U uh, Communist Party CP, the USA, actually uh, most of the writers. John Steinbeck, or many of the artists, writers, and intellectuals were all other members of the Communist Party or they were in the periphery. So we have that, um, we have that, um, that history. And I want to say that we need to, whether or not you are a socialist or not, we need to take examples of what the Marxists did in the 20th century and try to replicate it and apply it to the 21st century. I'm going to talk about solutions because it's easy. Um, this is we all know the problems, and uh, this is something that intellectuals and artists we all have uh, a problem, with, including myself. We can all kind of point out the problems and the symptoms of what's going on, but what solutions are there? And uh, we need to really start thinking about solutions. Um, very, and we don't have time. First of all, we need to revive working class culture. Um, we're here in uh, Point St. Charles, but how many people from the neighborhood are really here? How many people from the working class are actually at this conference? We gotta do better as far as doing that. If anything, what Trump represents is that we got trumped by reality TV. <laughs> And we all kind of laughed at reality TV. We all thought it was all trash culture. We dismissed it. We laughed at it. We didn't take it seriously. But actually, we should have taken it seriously. Because now, it's trumped us. And fringe every day, and I like what they say about that. Um, Halifax is a really good example of what they do. Uh, about that, uh, they have a various. They have a weekly open mic, and what they do is they uh, have it at different people's houses every 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 week. And we need to start opening up ourselves to the world, to society. We got to start. We got to stop being antisocial. We have to stop being more social. We have to start opening up next week and reaching out to strangers, to our neighbors. Give you an example of what we can do. I mean, just especially in cities, you know, we don't really talk to our neighbors or anything like that, but just talk to your neighbor and just say, hey, you know, just talk to them. Because people are lonely. We're all lonely. And people just want someone to talk to. People just want to be listened to. And unfortunately, uh, we as artists and intellectuals, we failed so bad <coughs> in that we haven't really listened to people, we haven't really talked to people. We just kind of, we're all kind of clickish. We just kind of stay within ourselves, and we lost we, we lost touch with we lost touch with where many people are, and and because we've lost touch with that Donald Trump or The Apprentice and his reality show and all these other trash, they were able to reach the masses where we haven't. We got to start reaching out to the masses, people. We really do. Yeah, go to a cafe. I wanted to, one of the things I liked about Serbia was that um, they're so social there, and so you go out to a cafe or a bar by yourself, someone will just come up to you and say, hey, you want a drink? You want a coffee? They'll come and sit down and talk to you, okay? <coughs> and finally, I'm just going to wrap it up. It's always tough to deal with a very important issue in such a short amount of time. Yes, 
we need to uh, start at the French, but I don't think we should stay at the French. I think we made a mistake. I made that mistake. I wanted to be uh, anti, uh, such a bohemian, anti-mainstream, but change never really occurs without the middle. We gotta start from the French, but we don't have to infringe on the mainstream. We have to get into, the, we have to get more people into the mainstream. That's what happened with the Harlem Renaissance. Before blacks were on the French, but thanks to the Harlem Renaissance <laughs> and jazz, blacks then became part of the mainstream. Mainstream is not necessarily bad. We gotta kinda get out of this thing that mainstream is bad. Yes, it's corporatized, but because there's no challenge to it. So yes, we do start at the French, but we need to make our way forward. Um, and because and change will never come into, uh, change will never come just from the margins. Change can start, but it has to come in the middle, in the mainstream, because that's how society changes. We have to bring the middle with us. We can't just be opposed to the middle all the time. We have to uh, challenge the middle, but then persuade them to come over to our way of thinking. Anyway, I have a lot more to say, but time goes so, so quickly. But I just want to thank you for your time and your attention.